That is what it takes to be healthy. We pay a lot of attention to the head. We figure if we know it, then we can do it, and that essentially everything can be known. For all of us who are healers, we understand that there are some things you can't know. We dramatically overemphasize what it is that we know. In the scientific paradigm, an essential Cartesian equation, the suggestion is that everything can be known. Our inability to know things is simply an inability to articulate the right question, that by and large we can know it all. That there is a definitive cause and effect relationship in everything in the world. It's ridiculous. Not everything can be known. And it's not an obscene shortcoming. We've dramatically overemphasized the head and de-emphasize those things that we can learn because we intuit it, because we feel it. So in Navajo country, this is called hojo, hojo. It means balance, harmony. It also is the same word for truth, beauty, and the great spirit. What a wonderful concept. To be healthy means that you are in balance, head, lips, and heart, mind, body, spirit that you are in truth, that you walk in beauty. In beauty, may you walk. We pay a lot of attention to the head, too little attention to the belly. We are trained to be good in the head. We are trained not to come to people with open heart because it distorts our clinical objectivity. I'm suggesting there are some things that we can't know, so no one way of explaining them is any better than any other way. Two people with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma treated with the same therapeutic protocol. One languishes and dies, the other thrives. Two identical twins, genetically, immunologically, the same, exposed to the same tubercular pathogen. One comes down with the disease, the other doesn't. Some things can't be known. We have to get away from our preoccupation with science that has become reduced to scientism, the idea that uh, everything can be known. Not everything can be known, and that's okay. If you have to know it before you do anything, you're only going to do what you've always done, because the only things you know are the things you've experienced. Everything else is a guess. Open yourselves up to new ways of doing the healing dance. The truth is not just what lends itself to test, retest, reliability, computer analysis, very much rotation of variables. The truth is not just what lies in the head. The truth is also what it is you feel. And if you want my opinion, I think the truth is always closer to what you feel in your heart, in your gut, than what you know in your head. Because the heart knows things that the mind doesn't want to think about. The heart has not been crippled by self-doubt. The heart allows us to imagine that we can move beyond our limitations. We need to touch people's hearts, not just their heads. And you need to spend time and talk to people to do it. Pay attention to what you feel. So I'm going to tell you this now parenthetically. I'm going to show you first a picture of my daughters. I have uh, five daughters. Four of them are shown here. You see these girls, these beautiful women? Now I'm going to show you my son-in-laws. Do you see these hormonal cripples? These are the guys who I had to share those princesses with. <laughs> so I go down to Belize on a vacation with my daughters and my, my sons. You can't imagine what that's like. I mean, to go on vacation and to pay for these guys to be sleeping with my babies. I <laughs> had I am a psychiatrist. You see, I've come to peace with this. <laughs> Any event, uh, we're going to dive. We're going to explore the ruins on the Guatemalan border. We go to Mayan country. Uh, so we are touring the ruins at Chinantnich, the entire family, and we are led around by a Mayan guide. And I happened to say to him, uh, are there any Mayan healers left? I'm interested in indigenous healing, traditional medicine. And he says, it just so happens that the last Mayan healer happens to be my uncle, who happens to live in a village that happens to be on the way back to your hotel. You want to pay attention to those things. 
Every act of creativity, every act of genius, every act of insight is simply the result of a prepared mind and a serendipitous moment. You're in the right place at the right time, your mind is prepared, and you see it. Ah, ha, that's how it happens. Change happens. Not by smearing your poopal on the walls four times a week for five years in traditional psychoanalysis. It happens like a bolt of lightning. You see something new. You want to open yourself up to seeing something new. You want to be prepared to do a different kind of dance, to hear different kind of music. So we stop in the village, and I wait to see this beautiful old man, Don Alijo Ponte is his name, I've written this story, who was then 93 years old. And I wait my turn in an orange grove outside of his five by eight banana frond thatched hut. I am sitting outside with an assortment of other patients. There are native people, there are the remnants of slaves who were brought to the Caribbean who inhabit a community in Dandriga in the south of Belize called Garifunas. There were Mennonites who had come from Canada through the United States and Mexico to Central America seeking religious freedom, freckle-faced, blue-eyed, still speaking German, and Karl Hammerschlag, a psychiatrist from New York, uh, waiting his turn. My wife and daughters are, of course, shopping. They can do that anywhere. And I, <laughs> I wait my turn. Comes my turn, I go to see Don Alijo. Beautiful man dressed in white muslin, embroidered in the Mayan colors of his village, easily identifiable to other Mayan groups. A candle is burning, copal incense smells a little like turpentine. He's wearing huaraches and a rope belt. My bus driver and interpreter introduced me as Dr. Karl Hammerschlag. He is, a, he is a doctor. And I, in my elementary high school Spanish, tell Don Alijo that I am a, a physician. I've worked with indigenous people. And I want to ask him the critical question. There are patients waiting outside. And you know I've been well trained by my mother. Hurry up, ask the questions. There are sick people out there. You are not sick. If you were sick, you wouldn't want to wait. Don't take too much time. Hurry up. It's inconsiderate. Don't be unkind. <laughs> so I ask him my critical question. So what's the most important thing that you have learned that allows you to heal people? And he thinks about this, what seems an interminably long time, and says that what he has learned that allows him to heal people is not to take a cold drink on an empty stomach on a hot day. <laughs> I, I'm another mystical holy man. And I look at him with incredulity. What? I look to my interpreter and I say to him, ask the question again. I think it's lost something in the translation. <laughs> and he asks him again, what's the most important thing you've learned that allows you to do touch people in healing ways, and he says, don't take a cold drink on an empty stomach on a hot day. And I ask him, why? And he says, because it gives you bad belly. And I, still not getting it, say, bad belly? Bad belly? He says, yes. He says, you can't heal people if you come to them with bad belly. <laughs> this is what I'm telling you. Most of us are trained to come to our patients with no belly at all. We call this dispassionate clinical objectivity. And now in an economic environment in which time is money and we have only four minutes to see patients, we don't have time to develop a relationship with people that allows us to touch our bellies in ways that remind us of our humanity. We need to come to patients with good belly. And you are singularly placed in a position to be able to do that because the expectation is that you will do as physician assistants, what the rest of us as physicians who have to make diagnostic code numbers in order to get reimbursement are failing to do. You want to honor that commitment. Come with good belly, good and open heart that reminds us of what it is that we like best about what we do and how it is we take care of patients.